Some ATV enthusiasts continue to obsess about more horsepower in the 1 liter ATV segment. Whether their talent level or their machine's chassis is capable of dealing with it. Fortunately, we're happy to see that the horsepower war has cooled down a bit for the time being. Attention seems to have shifted to making these big machines more usable, versatile, and better handling. The 1000cc 4x4 class is where new technology like electronic throttles with different performance modes, high performance suspension, and other high end features are most prevalent. If you're looking to buy a machine in this class, chances are it's either going to be a Polaris or a Can-Am. The Polaris Sportsman XP1000 received its most recent round of significant updates in 2017, with minor updates each year since. Choosing between the Sportsman XP1000 and its arch rival, the Outlander 1000R used to be a bit easier. If you valued brutal acceleration over handling, you went with the Can-Am. If you valued handling more greatly, you went with the Polaris. In 2019, Can-Am widened out the Outlander's track width, updated its suspension, and made a number of other key updates, including the addition of variable throttle modes on the 1000R. This shuffled the deck on the 1000cc class quite a bit, creating the need for this shootout. ATV On Demand's 2020 1000cc 4x4 ATV shootout was made possible by Maxima Premium ATV Engine Oil, formulated for today's higher revving, hotter running, high performance engines. Exceeding OEM specifications, its proprietary additives create a sheer, stable polymer system, providing unsurpassed protection against wear, oxidation, viscosity, and thermal breakdown. Its wet clutch formula provides outstanding fade-free clutch performance. Maxima Premium ATV Engine Oil, available at power sports dealers everywhere. With this shootout in mind, we asked Can-Am and Polaris to send us the top-of-the-line versions of their 1000cc machines, neither of which has received performance-enhancing upgrades for 2020. Can-Am sent us their Outlander 1000R XTP Edition. It features front and rear bumpers, a 3,000-pound worn winch, hand guards, beadlock wheels, and premium Fox Podium 1.5 QS3 shocks. The Sportsman Premium Edition we're using from 2019 has been replaced by the factory installed trail package for 2020. It features a cut and sewn seat cover with an added inch of foam for enhanced comfort, an upgrade from 26 inch CST to 27 inch Duro Power Grip tires, arched A arms, and a Polaris 3500 pound winch. The trail package gains lower LED headlights and color matched suspension springs although the front bumper is now an accessory add-on. For the head-to-head -head performance comparison of these machines, we outfitted both with a few aftermarket accessories to maximize engine performance and ensure reliability. First, we installed stainless steel HMF Titan QS exhausts on both machines. HMF's Quiet Series exhausts help maximize power while keeping sound output to a respectable one to two decibels of stock. Both systems demand more fuel to match their increased airflow, so HMF fuel optimizers were installed on both. This complete setup provides notably more engine performance and cooler running temperatures from both machines. Look for our full review of HMF's Titan QS exhaust and fuel optimizers coming soon. To help prevent flats during and after our shootout, we use Tirejet, engineered with liquid rubber. It contains active sealing particles and Kevlar fibers for a permanent seal of slow leaks or punctures up to 3 eighths of an inch. Tirejet is far less expensive than run flat tire systems and its low viscosity won't cause vibration like other tire sealants. Order online directly at Tirejet.com. Our test riders include Evan Hartzell, who races cross country on 450cc sport ATVs. Aaron Meyer, a former pro ATV motocross racer turned farmer, and Chad Westcott, 
an experienced trail rider and a Sportsman 1000 owner with previous Outlander 1000 experience. Our shootout took place over five days, concluding at East Fork MX located in New Vienna, Ohio, featuring a cross-country race course designed by former pro GNCC dirt bike champion Scott Plessinger. For this shootout, both machines will be rated by our riders on a scale of 1 to 10 for engine, drivetrain, suspension, handling, braking, fit and finish, and utility performance. There is also two bonus points up for grabs based on four special tests, drag race, cross country race, best utility, and best initial value. Comparing the two top of the line machines, the Sportsman has a base price of $12,099 with a trail package adding $1,000 for a total price of $13,099. One level down from the Outlander XTP package we're testing is Can-Am's XT package, which sells for $12,749. Like the Polaris trail package, it features arch day arms and color matched suspension springs, Can-Am standard ITP tear cross tires, plus the Outlander XT benefits from hand guards and tough front and rear steel bumpers for $350 less than the trail package equipped Sportsman. The $14,449 Outlander 1000 RXTP builds on the XT package, adding beadlock wheels, high performance Fox Podium 1.5 shocks, tapered aluminum handlebars, and race inspired wraparound handguards. Although the XTP package has a $1,350 higher retail price, Upgrading your Sportsman with the equivalent features of the Outlander XTP will easily set you back an additional $2,000. If the lowest retail price matters most to you, a base model Sportsman XP1000 will set you back $650 less than the Can-Am XT package. However, we feel that what you get for your money matters most, and that's why we believe that the Can-Am Outlander 1000R XT or XTP offer the best initial value. Engine configuration is very different on these machines. Polaris 952cc ProStar parallel twin cylinder engine features four valves and single overhead cams per cylinder, producing a claimed 90 horsepower. Can-Am's 976cc Rotax features a V-twin design with four valves and single overhead cams per cylinder, producing a claimed 91 horsepower. Fuel injection is used on both machines. They each feature electronic throttles with three different modes. Work mode to tame down the power for working or technical riding. Standard mode offers full throttle with smoother initial delivery and sport or performance modes, which gets you into the gas sooner in the throttle throw. Both top ends made up to fully automatic CVT transmissions, featuring high and low ranges plus neutral reverse and park. Polaris uses a larger, longer throw gear selection lever, with a Can-Am using a lower profile gated shifter. Both machines feature engine braking, with the Polaris offering their four-wheel drive active descent control, which when engaged, works to keep the machine moving at a very slow, controllable pace on downhills. Due to the clutching on the Polaris, I feel like there wasn't as much power off the bottom end. Uh, Mid-range seemed to get up and go, uh, didn't top out real fast. Uh, I felt like there's always more power there than I needed. Uh, overall, it was a very great engine. Uh, probably due to clutching, but it rolls on so smooth that it feels like the low end doesn't pack the punch that you're anticipating. That changes in the mid-range. The mid-range is super snappy and super responsive. And the high end feels like the ceiling is really high. With the transmission effectiveness on the Polaris, uh, it's, it's a very smooth engagement, uh, very easy to control. It's not quite as snappy as the Can-Am through the entire range, but it definitely rolls the power on in a very manageable way. When you get into the engine braking, you know, coming into a corner or going down a hill on the Polaris, um, it can seem a little overwhelming to me. When you come off at higher speeds, the engine braking 
starts to slow the machine down much more abruptly than you would experience on almost any other four-wheeler. Overall rideability on the Polaris, uh, it's really smooth. Um, if I wanted to go on a trail ride all day, this would be the perfect quad for it. Overall, the engine on the Polaris I thought was very good for overall rideability. Um, it was smooth, it wasn't tiresome. Despite the amount of power that the machine has, it's made very effective to do a variety of things and it does all of them really well. The calmer, more controllable Sportsman 1000 took second from all three of our riders due to its more mellow power delivery throughout the RPM range. Engine braking is a little strong for play riders. Both machines scored equally for transmission effectiveness for different reasons. The Sportsman for its manageability. Thanks to Chad and Evan, the Sportsman scored a bit higher in overall rideability due to its smoother power delivery. The reason why all of our test riders agreed that the Polaris had the engine of choice for long rides. However, extremely aggressive riders may want to look into more aggressive clutching. Dalton Industries tells us that their clutch kit for the Scrambler and Sportsman 1000 improve off idle snap for quicker takeoffs and makes getting a load moving easier. They also recover 75% of the performance loss from running taller, heavier tires and wheels. Faster back shifting under load from things like mud, sand, hills, or working helps reduce belt slippage for improved durability and responsiveness to throttle input. Adjustable flyweights allow tuning for different riding styles, terrains, and stock or oversized tires. Learn more at DaltonIndustries.com. The power is incredible on the Outlander. It hits extremely hard on the low end and pulls hard all the way through the mid and top end. Low, mid, and top on the Can-Am, all three are very exciting, uh, very impressive. Transmission engagement on the Can-Am, uh, it, really, it really hits hard off the bottom. Uh, when you go to get back in the throttle anywhere you're at, uh, power-wise, it's always going to be there. Transmission effectiveness, um, you can tell this machine is built for aggressive trail riding or some sort of racing. Uh, it, it, the transmission engages hard and it stays, stays engaged. Uh, it's very fun to ride fast. With the work mode on the engine, it does help with unwanted throttle inputs. Uh, it does make it a little bit smoother, but still the transmission still engages hard and uh, it, it is a little tricky to ride even in work mode. Engine braking on the Can-Am is a lot smoother. I really prefer it on um, downhills, uh, going into corners. Uh, lets you get into the corner a lot better and a lot faster. The Outlander isn't as smooth or as manageable as the Sportsman. It hits hard and continues to pull very aggressively. It is the more responsive of the two. Overall rideability. I like it. Um, I'm an aggressive rider, I can handle it for, for a long day, but um, it still makes me tired. It, it, it does take a little bit of energy to ride this machine, but uh, it is aggressive, it is exciting, and it is fun. But uh, you, you better be in shape for this one. The Can-Am takes top honors in engine performance. Our riders unanimously rated the Outlander's power output higher throughout the RPM range. They tied it in transmission effectiveness. The Can-Am for its superb responsiveness. Aaron solely preferred the overall rideability of the Can-Am for its hard-hitting nature. It's the motor that seems best suited for racing or extremely aggressive riding, but it's going to require you to expand more energy to hold on to on the trail or the job site. Dalton Industries tells us that the Can-Am is more prone to having belt issues in high range in high load situations like working mud, sand, or steep hills, even if you're using stock size tires at higher speeds. Their kits for the Outlander 1000R are designed to backshift more quickly under load, reducing belt slippage for improved durability and performance. Their kits also recover 75% of lost performance from running larger, heavier tires and wheels. Dalton's adjustable flyweights allow you to tune the clutch for different riding styles or tire sizes, with instructions available on their website. Learn more at DaltonIndustries.com. Both machines feature two and four wheel drive, offering the most recent and high performance versions of their unique systems. Can-Am's Viscolock QE system has a limited slip front differential for lighter steering until one of the front tires begins spinning faster than the other. This creates hydraulic pressure in the front differential that quickly locks in both front wheels. When traction is restored, 
the VSCO-LOX system progressively unlocks. The high-performance all-wheel drive system on the Polaris operates in two-wheel drive for lighter steering until the rear tires begin to rotate marginally faster than the fronts, after which both front wheels quickly engage, providing locked-in four-wheel drive until traction has been restored to the rear tires. The four-wheel drive systems on both these ATVs, uh, I didn't have a problem with either of them. The one thing I don't like about the four-wheel drive system on the Can-Am is that you have to slow to basically a crawl to engage it. But I personally have never found a situation where Visco Lock didn't work extremely well. The four-wheel drive works, works good on the Can-Am, but uh, you have to slow down very slow to almost a crawl to get it to actually engage. Evan rated drivetrain performance a tie. Aaron and Chad rated the Can-Am second because they had to slow down to engage four-wheel drive. So the Outlander's drivetrain took second. One of the things I really like about the Sportsman is the all-wheel drive engagement. You can select it on the fly. You see an obstacle on the trail that you want all-wheel drive for, and the button is right there in a very logical position for your thumb. The all-wheel drive system on the Sportsman feels very effective. You never feel a slip from the back tires. It always feels like it's hooking up and engaging exactly when you need it to. The four-wheel drive on the Polaris, uh, to me, feels like a very good system. You can shift it on the fly while you're going. You don't have to ride with it in four-wheel drive, but if you happen to be in four-wheel drive while you're riding, it's not as clunky and cumbersome as some of, as some of the machines. We'd have to do some testing with the same tires on both machines in order to pick a winner in drivetrain effectiveness. However, the drivetrain engagement of the Polaris scored unanimously higher, as you don't have to slow way down to engage all-wheel drive. This small detail was big enough to allow the Polaris to take the win in drivetrain performance. At the end of the day, we lined up both machines for repeated drag racing on a 150-yard drag strip. Whether they were piped or stock, the outcome remained the same, with the Outlander winning by one to two bike lengths, regardless of rider, taking the win in drag racing. The Sportsman is built on Polaris XP steel chassis. Originally introduced in 2009, it's made for arguably the best handling big bore 4x4 for years. Dual A arms are found at both ends, with arched A arms on the trail package. Five way preload adjustable shocks control 9 inches of suspension travel front and 10 and a quarter inches out back. The rear suspension features a sway bar to help control body roll. The Outlander is built on Can Am's Generation 2 single spar technology steel chassis benefiting from a wider stance and a bit more suspension travel starting in 2019. Dual A arms with arched lower arms are used up front, with Can-Am's unique torsional trailing independent rear suspension out back. There's 9.2 inches of suspension travel front and 9.9 .9 inches of travel rear, controlled by Fox Podium 1.5 QS3 shocks on the XTP package. They provide threaded preload adjustment, selectable three-way compression damping, and nitrogen reservoirs for cooler oil temps for more consistent damping. Sway bars are found at both ends for added stability. According to the manufacturer's specs, the Outlander is 48 inches wide with a 51 inch wheelbase. The Sportsman is 47.6 inches wide with a 53 inch wheelbase. The Can-Am has an overall height of 49.5 inches with a 34.5 inch seat height and 11 inches of ground clearance with its 26-inch ITP Terracross tires. The Polaris has a claimed overall height of 50.75 inches with a 37-inch seat height and 12 inches of ground clearance, with its 26-inch CST tires used on the base model, not the 27-inch Duro power grips used on the trail package. Both machines feature electronic power steering, with Can-Amp's tri-mode system offering three different levels of assistance. Polaris is claiming a dry weight of 801 pounds for the Sportsman XP1000, not including the weight of the trail package. Can-Am is claiming 826 pounds for the Outlander 1000 XT. Add in the B-Lock wheels and upgraded shocks from the XTP package, and the Can-Am's weight grows.
The sportsman's shock seem to be set up for maximum comfort at the speeds the Polaris feels most riders will ride at, rather than to deal with the performance capabilities of the engine. Small bumps virtually disappear underneath the sportsman. But uh, as soon as you start going fast and trying to aggressively trail ride, uh, you start bottoming out, even though we stiffed them up. In addition to helping reduce bottoming, we maxed out the front shock's preload settings to help fight front end dive and body roll entering corners aggressively. We ran the rear shock's preload in the middle setting to help prevent excessive weight transfer to the front under braking and on downhills. Uh, with uneven terrain, uh, I feel like Polaris moved a lot better uh, due to the suspension and the lack of a front sway bar. Over the whoops and poles, the sportsman had a tendency to get a little bit squirrely. Even though with the salter suspension on the Polaris, uh, with the longer wheelbase, I felt like it was a lot more smooth through the whoops. With an upgraded set of shocks, I really think this quad would stand out. The Sportsman comes with five-way preload adjustable shocks, and there's a big difference between all the way soft and all the way firm on the adjustment settings. Uh, but however, that's all we had was the preload adjustment. Um, and then when we were adjusting the preload, it, it wasn't really the most fun task to do. Um, I wish it was a little easier. Maybe some threaded preload would make it a lot nicer if that's all we're going to get. The Sportsman squared a bit higher for small and uneven bumps, falling a bit behind in the whoops, and more than two and a half points on big hits and tunability. It is the plusher of the two machines, but if you're pushing the limits, its shocks run out of bottoming resistance long before the engine runs out of power. There's a night and day difference between the Sportsman's five-way preload suspension and the premium Fox Podium 1.5s on the Outlander. Once we got to tune the suspension on the Can-Am, it did start to work the small bumps a little bit better. Uh, however, it's not quite as soft and plush as the Polaris is on the smaller stuff, but it does work tremendously better on the bigger hits, the G-outs, um, you know, your high-speed high bumps. Uneven bumps on the Can-Am seem to be a little stiff and is like it didn't flex as much. It might have been due to the front sway bar and the firmer suspension. The, the suspension is a little bit stiffer. It doesn't articulate as much as the Polaris, but uh, it still handles them fine. Uh, you, you just feel them a little bit more. For a bit more small bump compliance and weight transfer entering turns, we backed off spring preload two turns at all four corners. With the compression damping in the middle setting, there was plenty of bottoming resistance for all but the heaviest riders. With the shocks on the Can-Am with the uh, compression and the threaded preload, uh, we started out with a pretty stiff bike and uh, softened it up a little bit to get a little bit more corner entry speed out of it and feel a little bit more comfortable on the bike. The tunability on the Can-Am, uh, it was plenty stiff for utility work and then once we got to our aggressive trail riding portion, uh, we was able to tune it and uh, made it a great weapon in the trails for us. The Outlander XTP isn't quite as plush over smaller uneven bumps, although it will easily eat up big bumps, jump landings, and whooped out terrain that would have the sportsman bottoming and wallowing in its travel. Tunability and performance over large bumps are on another level. The XTP suspension unanimously rated higher among our riders. The Polaris seems to have some pretty good steering in it. Um, it goes where you want it to. You, know, you point the handlebars, it goes there. Uh, the only thing I wish is that you could have the same great steering with it, but with less movement of the handlebars. Steering precision on the Polaris overall is pretty good. Uh, it did push a little bit more. I feel like it might have been because of the tires. The uh, power steering on the Polaris, I felt like it really absorbed the bump feedback. Uh, I was with the Can-Am, it felt a little bit light, and I got a little bit more of that feeling through the handlebars. The power steering on the Polaris, uh, it's very powerful power steering. When you're going slow and in technical or you're working with it, um, it, it, it works great. As you start to get into the mid-range and more towards the top end and the speed starts to increase, that's when you feel a little bit of twitchiness from the EPS. When you get into the corners, um, the bike feels almost feels a little too boaty for me. Um, it does turn where you want it to go, but the suspension feels a little soft and you get a lot of body roll with it. 
Um, so to really get it to go through a corner, it seems like we were really having to move quite a bit uh, to get the field planted and to not roll very much on us. The cornering and high speed stability on the Polaris felt a lot better, uh, simply due to the fact that the seat sat lower. I get a more aggressive riding style that way, and I just felt better. High speed stability on the Polaris uh, felt very nervous. Uh, could be the power steering, could be, could be a number of things. The power steering and the ergonomics with the slimmer midsection on the Sportsman definitely make it feel like a more manageable machine. The weight and balance feels a little bit better. Weight, feel, and balance in the Polaris, it's, it's pretty much a mixed bag. If you're in a slower technical area, uh, I like it. The steering makes it feel light. Um, it's a little bit, feels a little smaller to me in the midsection, but with a soft suspension, you get out on a faster trail, the body roll makes it feel a little bit heavier because you have that weight transfer moving around on you. The weight, feel, and the balance on the Polaris uh, felt good. Uh, simply to the ergonomics, the seat sitting lower, the handlebars a little bit higher. Uh, I felt like I could handle the quad and get a lot more aggressive riding style. Uh, with the less grippy tire, the quad could slide a lot more. I get a lot looser in the corners, which made me feel like I could handle the floor a lot better. Ground clearance in the Polaris looks pretty good on paper, but once we get the riding it, uh, you can feel a bottom drag through some ruts and over some of the wall crossings, so. The Sportsman 1000 scored a bit higher in cornering stability and weight feel and balance. It tied in power steering effectiveness due to its lighter steering effort at low to intermediate speeds, scoring a bit lower in high speed stability and ground clearance. The Sportsman has lost its handling advantage, but only by a thread. Firmer, sportier suspension and better tires could have kept it on top. Steering precision, uh, the Canium, it has good traction in the front. Uh, it steers good, it goes where you want it to. Uh, I don't feel like you're over rotating the handlebars to get it to go uh, where you need it to go. The steering precision on the Canium isn't bad at all. I just wish the power steering assisted you a little more going into corners and going through bumps. You definitely have to work a little bit harder with the DPS on maximum assist than you do with the EPS on the Sportsman. But it was stable, it wasn't twitchy at high speeds, uh, it worked fine at low speeds and technical areas. Cornering stability felt better on the Sportsman than the Outlander to me. With the trailing arm suspension, it feels like your balance can get thrown off just a little bit. Cornering stability was very good on the Can-Am. Uh, we, we did have to tune the suspension a little bit. It seemed a little rigid at first, but after we worked with the shocks, uh, we was able to get it to, to be able to set into the corners. You do have two sway bars on the Can-Am. Uh, it keeps the planet. You don't have body roll, and uh, you can go through a corner with confidence on the Can-Am. The Outlander feels very stable at high speeds, especially in a straight line. High speed and stability on the Can-Am really wasn't bad. Uh, I did feel that I sat a little bit higher, um, which made me feel a little bit more uncomfortable. Weight, feel, and balance. Um, you, have, you have great throttle response and power of this machine to make it feel light. Uh, you have good, good power steering. It doesn't feel heavy when you turn it. Um, and and it, it's stable, you don't get any body roll anywhere. For weight, feel, and balance, the Outlander feels a little bit clunkier to me. I think part of that has to do with the wider midsection because of the clutch placement. The bars are also lower, and I'm a taller guy. The ground clearance on the Can-Am seemed to uh, be a lot better. Uh, it could have been due to the shorter wheelbase and the stiffer suspension. The Outlander scored a bit higher in steering accuracy, high speed stability, and ground clearance. But its heavier steering makes it feel heavier. No matter how competently the ATV was handling, its taller, broader seat detracts a bit from its stable feeling in corners. Evan and Chad both rated the Can-Am a bit lower, while Aaron rated it more than two points higher. It's nearly too close to call, but the Outlander's 2019 chassis updates, along with the XTP's firmer suspension settings, have allowed Can-Am to edge out Polaris in handling, if only by seven one hundredths of a point. Both ATVs feature single lever handlebar mounted all wheel braking, with a right side mounted rear brake pedal controlling the rear brake independently. Steel braided brake lines and parking brakes are also found on both. The Can Am has dual hydraulic disc brakes up front with a single hydraulic disc brake used out back. 
The Polaris has hydraulic disc brakes at all four corners. Both machines take up a good amount of real estate to scrub off speed due to their 800 pound plus dry weights. The brakes on the Polaris, uh, they felt pretty good, but it didn't actually do very good at stopping. There's a lot of body roll with it, so you gotta be kind of careful. Um, and you, you really just slide. The Polaris brakes felt good, but the back seemed to lock up uh, pretty fast. Uh, could have been due to the tires. Uh, I'm not sure, but they did seem to lock up and bounce on me. I almost never use the rear brake by itself on the Sportsman, and that's true for both machines. You have to lift your foot up to engage the rear brake, and it's just not in a great position. The Sportsman finished a very close second to the Can-Am in terms of all-wheel braking performance, but the rear brake seemed to lock up a bit too easily. Aaron and Evan both rated it second, with Chad rating the Sportsman higher, due to its dual rear brakes improve longevity. Braking on the Outlander is similar to the Sportsman in terms of how it's applied. The bias is also tends to be a little bit more towards the rear. I also wasn't a huge fan of the foot lever on the Outlander either. The brakes on the Can-Am, uh, the, hand, the hand lever and the foot pedal both feel good. They both work good. Um, you also don't have any diving issues with the Can-Am. And we also get the stop. The tires work very good for braking as well as acceleration. The Outlander scored a bit higher in all-wheel braking and significantly in rear-wheel braking. Racers understand the importance of braking performance more than most. Aaron and Evan both rated the Can-Am higher, giving it the win in braking performance. Ergonomics on the Can-Am, I felt like I sat up a lot higher. Uh, going into corners, I could not get as comfortable. I couldn't move around as much on the bike. Uh, I don't like how wide the midsection is and the seat's a little bit too tall for me. Uh, however, the fenders give you much more room to move around and the foot pegs are much more aggressive. They actually gave me a lot more grip on my boot uh, where I could plant my feet and when I'm going into corners or rough sections and trying to hold on to the quad. The control operations on the handlebars of the Outlander feels a little bit busy to me, but it's because of the additional features. Controls on the Can-Am, the brakes felt really nice, the shape of them. Um, the gated shifter uh, was in a really nice location. Uh, I never touched it with my knee. The throttle was just, uh, I did not like it. It was way too light for me. Just some small vibrations, nothing major, but I could feel it in my boot. I like the instrument display on the Outlander. I like the position of it, and I like the information that you can gather from it. I like the instrument display on the Can-Am. Uh, simply due to the fact that you can change your bars out, um, all you got is a bar pad there. As far as the attention to detail, I feel like I have to give the win to the Outlander on this one. Say for instance when you're putting an exhaust and fuel module on, uh, it's easier to, to access everything we needed for those two pieces. The fitment of the various pieces of plastic seem to require less of the plastic push pins and overall have a cleaner, more aesthetically pleasing look. One of the major things are the tires. Um, those ITP tires on the Can-Am, they work much better. Uh, I mean, you're talking about 90 horsepower ATVs, you need some traction on them. The players may have done quite a bit better for me if it had had some tires like the Can-Am has. The Can-Am took top honors in attention to detail, but fell behind a bit in the other categories in fit and finish, with all of our riders rating it a pretty close second. I really prefer the ergonomics on the Polaris. Uh, I like the throttle a lot. It was a lot smoother throttle. Uh, the brakes, they all felt great also. Uh, the seat actually sat a lot lower to me, it felt like, um, which made me a lot more comfortable in the quad, which I get a lot more aggressive and ride a lot harder. I really like the ergonomics on the Sportsman. The taller handlebars and the narrower midsection feel really good. Uh, as a smaller rider, I like the narrower feel of the foot pegs. Um, however, the foot pegs are very small, they're very slick, uh, they didn't work good in the mud, they didn't get, work good in the dry, they didn't work good on side hills, you had no traction, you, my foot kept slipping everywhere. And the seat, the seat is very soft, but it's way too soft, we kept feeling the seat pan. The control operations on the handlebars of the Sportsman feel like a very logical layout. The throttle feels good, the four-wheel drive engagement is in a logical position. Some of the things I don't like are the extremely long lever to shift into the different gears. I like the shifter on it. Um, 
you, there's no notches to move through, it's just front to back. I felt both these bikes had very low vibration. Uh, compared to a 450 race bike, they're, a, they're very smooth. The instrument display on the Polaris I like. Uh, easy to read when you're riding, um, easy to read when you're sitting down or standing up. One thing I do not like is that if you want to put on an aftermarket set of handlebars, you're going to have to relocate the dash panel somewhere. The attention to detail isn't as good as it could be on the Sportsman. There's hex bolts everywhere. Do a little bit of the pipe and programmer install. There's so many different fasteners and so many different tools, so many different pieces to take on and off. Uh, really wasn't fun. The Sportsman cleans up in nearly every aspect of fit and finish, except attention to detail. Its superior ergonomics are a big asset, helping in nearly every other category except engine performance. While it was competitive, the Polaris took the unanimous win in fit and finish. To test speed in the real world, we ran an abbreviated portion of East Fork MX Cross Country Loop, combining wide open field sections, a law crossing obstacle, and two sections of tight trail. The course would send our riders out, looping back, riding the first 80% of the trail in reverse. Cross Country racer Evan Hartzell went first. His reaction times were a fraction of a second faster on the Can Am, combined with its snappier clutching. Evan got off the line a little quicker on the Can-Am. Racing through the field section, it seemed that the Can-Am was pulling on the Polaris, riding through and exiting tighter turns, resulting in a 1.5 second lead for the Outlander exiting the field section, entering the tight chicane. Entering the first tight trail, the Can-Am had more than a two and a half second lead, a lead that grew to almost four seconds by the time Evan exited the log section. Exiting the second section of tight trail, the Can-Am maintained around a three and a half second lead. Upon reviewing the footage, we realized that Evan got a little confused on his first return trip on the Polaris, forcing us to throw out the second half of his lap, leaving the Can-Am with a three and a half second lead for Evan's cross country race. Up next was motocross racer Aaron Meyer. He had a nearly identical reaction, with the Can-Am taking a very small lead off the line. Halfway through the field section, Aaron started pulling just a bit on the Can-Am, with the Polaris tightening it back up to within a third of a second entering the chicane. By the time he exited the first tight trail section, the Can-Am had roughly a half second lead, remaining under a second by the time he hit the last log crossing on the first half of the lap. Exiting the second tight trail section, Aaron had nearly a full second advantage aboard the Can-Am as he began his second half of the lap. The Can-Am maintained its lead, exiting the first tight section of trail and the chicane for the second time. As the trail opened up, the Polaris started making up ground. In the end, with Aaron aboard, the Can-Am took a very scant 16 one hundredths of a second victory over the Polaris. Daylight was fading fast as Chad took to the track. His reaction time was almost identical on both machines, with the snappier Can-Am taking a very slight lead off the line. Within a few turns though, Chad had the Polaris out front, leading by around a half second as he entered the chicane. By the time Chad had exited the first stretch of tight woods, the Can-Am was back out front, with around a three quarter second lead. Exiting the log section for the first time, the Outlander stretched his lead to three and a half seconds maintaining just over a three second lead, exiting the second stretch of tight trail, beginning the race back to the start finish line. Racing back to the logs, Chad had the sportsman within one and a half seconds of the Outlander, entering the first tight trail section for the final time. Exiting the chicane and entering the field section, the Can-Am quickly began pulling away, but on a long downhill straight, Chad was able to run down the Outlander, with both machines running in a virtual tie. A few turns later, Chad crossed the finish line in first on the Can-Am, by a small two-tenths of a second. Better tires and snappier clutching could have easily put the Polaris on top in this test. And if you're a better rider than your buddy on his Outlander, chances are you're going to be faster than him on the Polaris. The Outlander 1000 benefits from a rider with a slightly higher skill set and fitness level, but rewards them with an ATV 
drifted slightly faster on the trail. With Power Limit, a non-factor on either of these machines, small details make a big difference when it comes to deciding which one works harder. Both use composite racks. Polaris steel reinforced racks are rated to haul 125 pounds front and 240 pounds rear. They feature raised removable tie-down points and integrated bucket rings on the rear rack. The Can-Am is rated to haul 100 pounds front and 200 pounds rear, with its racks featuring a high-grip rubberized surface. Both machines' racks are designed to work with their brand's proprietary line of quick-attach accessories. Sealed cargo boxes are located underneath the racks on both ends of the Polaris, providing a combined six gallons of storage. The Can-Am features 5.7 gallons of storage, located behind and below the rear rack. The Sportsman is ready to tow 1,500 pounds with its 1.5-inch hitch receiver. The Outlander is ready to tow 1,650 pounds with its full-size 2-inch hitch receiver. To put the machines to the test, we first stuffed the Polaris storage boxes to capacity, then transferred all of the items to the Can-Am to see if and how they would fit. We then strapped 120 pounds of concrete to the front racks, 220 pounds to the rear racks, and took them for a spin. Lastly, we attached a trailer to each machine, loading up the competition and pulling it around to see how their towing capabilities compared. To make things more difficult, we loaded both ATVs on the front of the trailer to maximize tongue weight. The storage capacity and compartments on the Polaris, they're very nice. Uh, easy, easy to access when you had your supplies in there. You can really see what you had and you, should, you can just remove or use what you needed. But the problem is, if you have the racks loaded down, you can't access the storage compartments. Uh, strapping things down on the Polaris, uh, we did notice that it likes to move around whatever you strap on there. Uh, and also, there's not as many points to strap to. Uh, when we hooked a ratchet strap to the front end, we did notice the ends of the uh, racks flaring up on us. Uh, so you couldn't get anything real, real tight. Ooh, can't really strap it too much. Ooh. While loaded, the Polaris uh, felt like it was a little bit uh, sluggish off the bottom, probably due to the clutches. Uh, compared to the Can-Am, it wasn't as snappy, uh, but it did have the power it needed. And it's not jerky or twitchy when you're loaded, uh, so you get a lot of control in those slower sections when you're loaded down. Handling while loaded, there's a lot of body roll when you put that weight up high on the Polaris. While loaded, the Polaris seemed to bottom out a lot faster, and it did not recover quite as quickly uh, while it was under a load. Uh, while towing with the Polaris, it did feel a little bit sluggish, but with a firmer throttle, I feel like it was a lot smoother pull, and it wasn't jumpy, uh, and the motor pulled very smooth. Engine braking also helped significantly while towing with the Sportsman. The Polaris while towing, um, you could really see that the rear suspension couldn't really handle it and you're, you're just shooting to the moon with it, which makes your steering not very good. The Sportsman scores a bit higher for its higher rack capacity ratings, more laid out storage boxes, and the engine's ability to more easily control a load while towing, under acceleration or braking. However, it fell behind when it came to handling and suspension while loaded even with the shock preload maxed out at both ends. Some also felt that its engine while loaded was a bit too smooth off the bottom. A lack of rigidity on the front rack and their hard slick surface hurt the Sportsman's rack effectiveness. Our riders were split, with Chad rating the Sportsman's utility capabilities higher than the Can-Am, but overall, it took a pretty close second. The storage compartment size is comparable on both machines. With the Outlander, the latch on the back felt a little bit cheap, but the advantage is you can load the racks down and still get to the storage compartment. Rack capacity and tie down points are excellent on the Outlander. One of the really nice features is the rubberized coating on the racks. It keeps your gear in place really well. The racks on the Can-Am, um, they gave us plenty of places to strap our load down to. Uh, they held our load in place. Uh, you know, they're not flexing, they're not flimsy. Uh, pretty solid racks. The engine while loaded on the Can-Am uh, it really felt good. It didn't feel any different than if you were riding it without a load on it. Plenty of power to get a, get a load moving, but uh, it, it is a little touchy when you get into some technical areas with it loaded, even in some of the engine performance options you have. Um, just, just a little touchy. Handling while loaded is much better than the Polaris. Um, 
can turn and didn't give you a, any body roll to it. Um, this just a lot better. The problem is, again for me, the effectiveness of the power steering. It feels like there's a lot of steering effort that has to be put in, and that's magnified when under load. I loaded down the Can-Am really seemed to hold its track and uh, go where I want it when I steered it. I like the firmer suspension on the Can-Am better while loaded down. Uh, you know, I wasn't g and out and some of, the, some of the holes and ruts around the barnyard. Um, it, it, handled that, it handled that concrete very well for us. The biggest benefit to towing with the Outlander is the two inch hitch receiver. They knocked it out of the park on this. There's no reason for an ATV not to have a two inch hitch receiver. Towing performance, and that snappy clutch worked pretty good, getting all that weight moving. Um, and the suspension held, handled it a lot better, it turned a lot better with that trailer on. Steering precision is very good on the Outlander while towing, much in part because of the ITP Terracross tires. The Outlander takes a small hit in onboard storage, but remains very competitive in towing performance. It wins in rack loading and effectiveness, engine handling and suspension while loaded. Aaron and Evan both rated the Can-Am slightly better than the Polaris, allowing the Outlander 1000 to win best utility. If you haven't been paying attention up till this point, it might sound like a bit of a landslide for the Can-Am. However, our test riders found these machines to be very competitive, yet very unique, with a mere 24 one hundredths of a point separating them in rider ratings. Of course, when you factor in and add a half point each for initial value, drag racing, best utility, and cross-country race test wins, the Outlander XTP appears to have an all-around advantage when it comes to pushing the limits of performance and value, giving the Outlander a nearly two and a quarter point advantage. A point scale to rate performance is one thing, but where you'd spend your dollars is the ultimate vote. Ultimately, I think I would go with the Sportsman. The way I like to ride, all day riding, the power is very manageable. The ergonomics seem to fit me better, and I really like the all-wheel drive system. If I was buying a 1000cc ATV, the Can-Am would be my choice. I feel like I would do a lot better in a race situation or even trail riding. I like the power that the Can-Am puts out and the handling. If I was going to buy one of these machines, I would buy the Polaris. Uh, I had trouble with the Can-Am. Um, I didn't like some of the vibrations in it. I'm going to buy a machine, uh, one, because I want to have fun on it. Two, I want to be able to have fun on it for as long as I own it, for a handful of years. Um, I want to be able to trail ride with it. I want to be able to work around the house, around the farm. The Outlander is a 1000 cc ATV that makes no apologies for being overpowered. If you're interested in racing, or simply pushing the limits of your machine's performance a majority of the time, the Can-Am Outlander 1000 XTP stands out. In the end, two of our three test riders chose the Polaris as the machine they'd rather own, due to its more comfortable ergonomics and controllable engine. This leaves us wondering if the Sportsman 850 would be a good option that's more affordable for those not stuck on the status of having a 1000 sticker on their machine. You could add clutching, tires, and shocks to the Polaris to close the small performance gap, but not without paying significantly more, while still giving up the Outlander's handguards, beadlock wheels, and bumpers. However, no amount of money is going to make the Can-Am as comfortable to ride as the Polaris, due to the Sportsman's slimmer ergonomics. In the end, without equally specced offerings from both manufacturers, it's impossible for us to fairly pick a winner. However, we hope that this shootout has provided enough information and insight to help pick the right machine for you. If you have any questions or insightful comments, we'd love to see them. Thanks for watching.